Uh, hey everyone, well, we're gonna go get started. Thank you all for joining us for the July 2023 monthly seminar on physical genomics. My name is James Peterson and I'm the Senior Director of Operations at the Senior Center for Physical Genomics and Engineering here at Northwestern University. As many of you know, our center is a cross-disciplinary research center that is focused on elucidating the structure and function of the genome through a convergence of super-resolution imaging, modeling, computational genomics, biology, and artificial intelligence. The mission of the center is to develop new strategies for the treatment of disease and the reversible engineering of living systems. In addition, the center aims to train the next generation of multidisciplinary scientists, specifically through our Physical Genomics Pre-Doctoral Training Program, or PGTP. PGTP is, a, is an NIH, NIGMS, T32 funded training program and is the first physical genomics based graduate training program in the US. Let's see. There we go. Dr. Bachman is the director of the PGTP, and Ben Keen and I help administer the program. We currently support eight predoctoral students. And to learn more about the PGTP, please visit uh, our the Center for Physical Genomics website and look under the education uh, tab there. Today we have uh, we're super excited to showcase three of our PGTP trainees. Shorn Graham will speak about mapping differences uh, in genome organiza organization to their function. Shorn is a physics PhD student in Adelson Modders Lab. Sophia Lampris will speak on biomimetic high density lipoprotein like nanoparticles as targeted radiosensitizers for prostate cancer treatment. Sophia is a PhD candidate, candidate in the Driscoll Graduate Program in Evil Life Sciences where she is advised by her PhD advisor, Shad Thexton. And rounding out today's talks, uh, Lucas Carter will speak on transcription and supernucleosomal chromatin organization. Lucas Carter is a PhD student in the Interdisciplinary Biological Sciences graduate program, where he's advised by Vadim Bachman. Sophia, at this time, if you'd like to share, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing. And uh, you can, yeah. Oh, wait, did it go? Am I going first? Yeah, or? yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Jordan. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going first. <laughs> yeah, that's right. My apologies. Yes, Jordan, if you'd like to go ahead and share your screen. Um, uh, for our audience, there will be time for questions at the conclusion of each talk, or you can type them into the Zoom chat and we'll address them afterwards. Uh, Jordan, Sophia, and Lucas, thank you so much once again for presenting today, and I'll turn the floor over to Jordan at this time. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, just to make sure everybody can hear me all right. I hear you great. Okay, awesome. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, my research uh, where I've been working on relating differences in the organization of the genome uh, to other cellular function. And um, the, the key word in this title is differences, and the reason for that will become clear very soon. Uh, and the particular part of genome organization I'm going to be focusing on is compartments. Uh, so I'm going to start this talk by uh, introducing more about what compartments are and how they relate to cell behavior. Um, a key part of understanding my research is understanding how compartments have traditionally been measured. Uh, and so I'll spend some time talking about that. And then I'm going to actually get into my results themselves. All right, so as most of you should know, the uh, Human genome is about six feet long, and all of that has to be folded into a nucleus that's about 10 microns in diameter. Um, and so there is a structure to how the genome is folded into the nucleus. Uh, and uh, it turns out that it's actually ordered, structured in a hierarchical way, uh, where you have different structures that emerge depending on the spatial skill that you're looking at. So at the largest scale, um, each chromosome takes up its own region in the genome, and those are known as nuclear territories. Uh, when you zoom on into about the megabase pair scale, uh, you see that there are regions of the chromatin that are close to each that are uh, close to each other and uh, don't tend to interact with other regions of chromatin, and these are known as compartments. And, and uh, the interesting thing about compartments is that the regions of chromatin that are in the same compartment that interact a lot with each other that are close spatially uh, might not be close to each other on the linear DNA. Um, and then if you zoom in even more, you'll see another structure uh, where you have these uh, regions, small regions of uh, chromatin that interact with each other and are close to each other on linear DNA. And these are known as topologically associated. Uh, so as I already mentioned, the focus for today is going to be on compartments. 
Uh, and compartments are have some really interesting connections to the behavior of the cell. Um, roughly, you can divide the entire genome into com two compartments, A and B. Uh, and compartment A is associated with gene transcription. Uh, it tends to be um, open DNA, and uh, it tends to have uh, epigenetic marks that are associated with transcription. Uh, meanwhile, uh, compartment B is the opposite of all of these things. There's not much gene transcription happening in compartment B. It's closed, and the epigenetic markings are associated with uh, repression of gene, gene transcription. Um, and so the uh, relationship between uh, compartments and um, cell behavior can be seen at the level of cell type. Uh, so here I'm showing a figure from a paper that studied the compartment structure across 21 different cell types. And what they found is that more than 50% of the genome switches between compartments A and B uh, in, in these 21 different cell types. Um, other people have also related uh, compartment structure directly uh, to gene transcription. Uh, so here I'm showing uh, uh, a figure showing uh, gene transcription over uh, the um, sorry about that. As as uh, uh, English is escaping me, but 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 uh, differentiation of a stem cell. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. So gene transcription as a as a cell stem cell differentiates, uh, and you um, are, are and on the x axis they're looking at. Uh, which region does the chromatin switch between different compartments, um, and how on the y-axis, how the uh, level of gene expression depends on those switches. Um, and so then they were able to associate how uh, changes in, compart in uh, the compartment membership associates with gene expression. However, uh, coming up with a tight connection between gene expression and compartment structure has also been challenging for a couple of reasons. One is that the, the changes in gene expression that are associated with compartment changes are often quite subtle. And this can be seen in this very same figure uh, where you have these large changes uh, where chromatin is switching from A to B or B to A. And especially in the um, earlier uh, cell lines, uh, there's not that much change in gene expression. Um, there are also situations where you have a large change in gene expression, but this isn't accompanied by any change in compartments. Uh, so here I'm showing uh, figures from a paper uh, where they applied heat shock to heat shock to cells, um, and so this is accompanied by a large transcriptional change, but the compartment hardly ever hardly changes as a response to this. Um, and to understand some of why it is difficult to make a relationship between gene expression, there, there are several reasons, but um, uh, one of them has to do with how comp con compartments are typically measured. Um, and so I want to spend a few minutes talking about that. And to understand that, we have to understand what a Hi-C contact map is. Um, so compartments are usually measured using Hi-C assay. And what Hi-C does is it measures the frequency of contacts between every locus in the genome. And the result of Hi-C is a contact map um, where the uh, entries of the contact map are proportional to the frequency of contacts. Um, and so here are some examples of the contact maps here. And the lower you are on the contact map, this corresponds to pair of loci that are closer to each other, and darker colors correspond to uh, higher contact frequencies. And using this contact maps, you can distinguish the different structures in the genome. Um, and in particular, for compartments, the, these show up as a plaid pattern on the contact map. So you have these alternating regions of high contact and low contact, and these correspond to the two compartments A and B. Um, so to get a, a measure of the, com, uh, of the compartment membership, you need to be able to somehow um, extract information about this plaid pattern. Uh, and this is usually done using principal component analysis. Um, so you start with your contact matrix, you um, transform it by dividing it by the expected counts, and then each row in this is giving you a contact profile for that locus. Um, so you can use that to get your correlation matrix, uh, which is then used to uh, you do PCA and get your principal component. Um, and the result of this is shown in this eigenvector here at the top in blue. 
And uh, what can be seen is that uh, the positive entries correspond to one compartment and the negative entries correspond to another compartment. And this corresponds very well to this plaid pattern, which is exactly what we want. Um, but it's also a little bit weird because principal component analysis, uh, what it really gives you is it gives you the direction of greatest variance in your data. And so all this is really telling you is that it happens to be that the uh, plaid patterns in the compartments correspond to the direction of greatest variance. Um, and it shouldn't be surprising that then this sometimes breaks down. Uh, for example, something that commonly happens is that uh, the principal component actually gives you uh, the two arms of the chromosome instead of the compartments. And then you have to look at um, the second or third principal component to actually get your compartment structure. Now, if you want to compare the difference between cell types, there, there is a fundamental issue with using uh, principal component analysis, uh, which is that um, it's really hard to uh, interpret what that means in different cell types. Um, it's based off of uh, eigenvector decomposition, uh, which is specific uh, to the specific contract make matrix, contact matrix uh, that you are deriving the eigenvectors from. And so if you have a value of a uh, compartment for 0.7 for locus in one cell type and 0.2 in another cell type, it's not really clear what those actually mean and how you would actually be able to compare them. Um, and so that makes it difficult to interpret um, beyond uh, changes in uh, you know, A to B and B to A, what this actually might mean when you are comparing to different cell types. Um, this isn't the only way to uh, measure uh, compartment structure. Other people have used clustering algorithms. Um, and this has a problem that this only provides you discrete labels. Um, you're not getting anything uh, fine scaled or continuous out of this that, that might give you some uh, more information about what's actually going on uh, between two, in the compartment structure between two different cells. Um, so other methods have also been developed uh, to uh, deal with these problems. Uh, they're, they're less popular, but they are, they are there. Um, I, I won't go through these in detail, but, but there is also a shortcoming for all of these methods, um, which is that um, their ability to detect quantitative differences that correspond to functional changes in the cell haven't been verified. Um, and this might be a little bit confusing, so let me explain what I mean by this. Um, so here I am showing two pairs of variables, x1 and y1, and x2 and y2. And um, you can think of that, this might x might correspond to a measure of compartment structure, y might correspond to another functional feature of the cell, such as epigenetic markings. And um, here I'm showing a situation where x and y are correlated. And you would, can look at this left panel here and this right panel here, and they might look very similar, but it turns out they're, they're actually quite different. And this is revealed by looking at the correlations and their differences. So on the left, even though X and Y are correlated and their differences are correlated as well, on the right, however, even though X and Y are correlated, um, their differences are not correlated. And so when we're thinking about measures of compartment structure, um, we want some sort of measure that um, isn't only correlated with other functional features of the cell, but the differences are correlated as well. And it's not clear that uh, any current measurements actually accomplish this. They might be more like the ones on the right. Um, and so my research was dealing with developing a uh, measure for, uh, chromatic, for compartment structure that has these three features that we need in order to have something that is you are, are able to say meaningful things about the differences between cell types. So we need something that gives a continuous rather than a discrete output. We need something that's uh, interpretable in the same way across cell types. And we need something, uh, a measure where we can actually verify that the uh, changes in the compartment structure correlate with functional changes between the cell types. Um, and so the measure I came up in order to accomplish this is something that I call compartment centrality. And the basic idea here is that we have these two compartments, A and B, um, and some of that chromatin is going to be very central to the compartment. So in other words, most of its contacts are going to be within the compartment itself, whereas other chromatin is going to be peripheral to the compartment. And that means that a lot of its um, 
that it's going to share roughly half of its contact with the two different compartments. Um, and I've chosen to quantify this using uh, the fraction of contacts to compartment A. So one means that you're very central to compartment A, zero means you're very central to compartment B, and 0.5 means that you're a that it's uh, peripheral. Um, and so here I'm showing how this is actually calculated from an initial condition. Um, and so you do it iteratively, and so um, eventually it converges to something that tells you, that um, gives you information about this plat structure, which is exactly what we want if we want to know what the compartments are. Um, we can also look at how well this corresponds to the principal component, and there, there is a strong correlation between uh, this fraction of connections to compartment A and the principal component that's typically used uh, to measure compartment structure. Uh, but the real strength of this um, is in its ability to be interpreted consistently across cells, which allows us to see whether um, it correlates with functional differences in the histone markings in different cell types, um, which is what I'm going to talk about for the last couple of minutes. Um, so the first point I want to make is that um, this does correlate with uh, histone markings, which is, is what we want specifically with um, these histone markings are the most interesting ones. Uh, because um, these are the ones that we actually expect to be correlated with the compartment structure. Um, in addition, just like um, PC, when we use PCA, it does work better for some chromosomes than other chromosomes. This is just what we expect. So it works really well for chromosome two. It doesn't work very well for chromosome 17. That's, that's what we expect to happen. Why? Uh, yeah, so it's have to do with um, the same reason I mentioned for PCA earlier, where sometimes um, instead of detecting compartments, you're detecting something else. So you might be detecting, for example, the chromosome arms instead, which aren't going to correspond to this active and inactive region of chrom chromatin. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, sure. OK. Um, right. So. Again, the key question is, does this correlate with difference in the histone markings? Um, and yes, it, it, it does. Uh, the, the correlation is, is weaker than for the histone markings themselves, um, which isn't surprising, but, but it's still there. Um, and so um, um, we can, again, do a similar thing before and uh, divide it by chromosomes. And we do see that for some chromosomes, it works better than for other chromosomes, which is, again, just as expected. Uh, so yeah, um, this this measure accomplishes what we want, which is it gives some. Uh, it, it's a measure that's uh, quantitative. It gives you more information than just discrete uh, labels for the compartments. Um, it's interpretable. It, it means the same thing across different cell types, and also changes in this measure are correlated uh, with changes with of other functional features of the cell, such as histone markings. Um, and that's my presentation. I'm happy to take a couple of questions. Thanks, Jaron. Uh, any additional questions, Luai? <laughs> uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> nice <try. laughs> yeah. I I could jump in with a question if that's okay. Please. Yeah. Um. So, Jaron, you mentioned that sometimes the uh automate the traditional method to detect compartments sometimes gives you funky results, doesn't detect compartments, but other aspects. Can you use the centrality to uh, detect when it's giving you bad results so that you don't, I mean, presumably people just looked at these results by hand, but can you automate this somehow with the compartment centrality? Yeah, so I think um, you don't really need to do that because it's not like uh, it, it's not a situation where sometimes you measure chromosome two and it gives you good results and sometimes it gives you bad results. Like human chromosome two will almost always give you a good result. And, you know, like, for example, fly chromosomes will almost always give you a bad result if you're you're using the, the principal component. Um, so it's it's. You don't really need to detect it automatically because you can once you know how things work for a chromosome, you you know, know how it always works. Does that answer your question? It has to do with the specifics, other specific features of the chromosome that are, and that are consistent. consistent. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right. 
Uh, thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you. All right. All right, I'll share my screen. Yeah, please. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to be presenting on a somewhat new project um, about uh, biomimetic high density lipoprotein like nanoparticles as targeted radio sensitizers for prostate cancer. So uh, in the United States, one in eight men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer during his lifetime. And the reason for this is while early stage prostate cancer is uh, highly treatable, um, prostate cancer has a 99% five-year survival rate, uh, disease uh, progression inevitably happens, uh, resistance to existing therapies, and prostate cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death for American men. Radiation therapy is a common and very effective strategy used to treat prostate cancer, uh, really across all stages and risk groups. Uh, it can be used to treat uh, early stage localized prostate cancer, uh, as well as bone metastases. Um, however, it's a significant challenge um, to minimize damage to normal healthy tissue surrounding the prostate, uh, while specifically targeting uh, the prostate gland. And the reason for this is just logistically that uh, the radiation beam has to pass through the body to reach the prostate gland. Uh, and this will cause a number of undesired side effects, uh, such as painful urination, uh, frequent urination, impotence, uh, blood in the stool or urine. Um, and if this could be mitigated, you know, that would, that would be great. Um, and in the Thaxton lab, we have biomimetic high density lipoprotein like nanoparticles that target the prostate cancer cell surface protein, SRB1. Uh, so you can see this is some patient data that SRB1 is uh, quite low in normal tissue uh, and that, is, that, it, that its expression increases uh, in tumors and more so in uh, metastases. Uh, and functionally, uh, our HDL nanoparticles are size, shape, and surface chemical mimics of native cholesterol-rich HDLs, which is the ligand for SRB1. So uh, our HDL nanoparticles will tightly bind SRB1, and they antagonize uh, the delivery of cholesterol esters from native HDLs, and this will um, effectively deplete the cell of cholesterol. Um, and this is the, the synthesis of the nanoparticles. Um, they have a gold core, and they're surface functionalized with lipoprotein A, uh, as well as uh, phospholipids to mimic uh, native HDLs. Um, and our goal is to be able to leverage the high differential expression of SRB1 in prostate cancer cells to specifically deliver radio uh, sensitizers to tumors. So uh, how our HDL nanoparticles uh, kill cancer cells um, is by inducing ferroptosis by transcriptionally downregulating GPX4. So uh, ferroptosis is a form of cell death that's characterized by the accumulation of cell membrane lipid peroxidation. And GPX4 is required to reduce and detoxify uh, oxidized membrane lipids. Um, so this is data from a, a paper that was from our lab a few years ago where the, the nanoparticles will uh, you know, first reduce the expression of GPX4. Uh, here's the blot showing that um, our nanoparticles will downregulate GPX4 um, and not normal human HDL. Uh, it doesn't affect it. Um, and further, that this downregulation is transcriptional. Um, and alongside, we also see that cholesterol biosynthesis genes um, increase, uh, which makes sense uh, considering we're uh, preventing cholesterol uptake into the cell. Um, and correspondingly, when we treat the cells with the nanoparticles, it will increase lipid peroxidation, uh, which makes sense with uh, the downregulation of GPX4. So uh, it's important to mention that uh, while ionizing radiation will uh, you know, directly damage uh, DNA and other biomolecules, uh, this, effect, this direct effect is really only about 30% of uh, the damage to DNA. Um, and the remaining 70% actually occurs from uh, the radiolysis of water that will generate free radicals and reactive oxygen species, 
and this will cause all sorts of damage to DNA. Um, and it also will damage uh, cell membrane lipids. Um, and uh, for this reason, uh, it, you know, the first reason why our HDL nanoparticles um, have radiosensitization properties is, you know, first that they lower GPX4 expression to promote lipid peroxidation. Um, and it's been shown that ionizing radiation and fructosis inducers will synergize uh, to enhance cancer cell death. Um, the second reason being that the gold nanoparticle core, so, sorry, go back, the core of our nanoparticles um, is a well-known radio sensitizer because it has a high atomic number uh, and a photoelectric coefficient that uh, actually causes a physical radiation dose enhancement. So, uh, you know, something to do with the inner sh shell of uh, electrons uh, where, uh, you know, heavy metals will have greater emission of electrons. Um, and, you know, this emission of electrons will cause damage um, that will break bonds and cause, uh, you know, further oxidative damage. Um, lastly, we can incorporate gold cell compounds into the nanoparticles to uh, enhance cancer cell killing. Uh, and one of them that we've been using is aranifen, uh, which targets another cell redox enzyme in addition to GPX4 uh, thyroidoxin reductase. Uh, and importantly, all of these properties can be simultaneously present on our HDL nanoparticles, which target SRB1 for specific delivery to prostate cancer cells. So to explain what I was talking about on the last slide, um, you know, this is the synthesis of our uh, standard HDL nanoparticles. Um, and we can replace these uh, phospholipids with uh, gold salt containing uh, phospholipids. Um, and, you know, further aranifin can be embedded in the phospholipid bilayer surrounding uh, the nanoparticles. Uh, and further, the core of the nanoparticles can be replaced with an organic core that will allow loading um, of, for example, cholesterol, which we've done before, um, and additionally, a ranifin, um for delivery uh, through SRB1 into the cells. So uh, to get to some of my data, um, I've been doing these colony formation assays uh, to first show uh, radio sensitization um, of our uh, nanoparticles uh, in prostate cancer cells. Um, and, you know, showing here, so, you know, here it's untreated. I have increasing doses of radiation in PBS treated cells. And, you know, we see that radiation uh, affects the cell survival. Um, and what's interesting is, you know, first, our, our nanoparticles, uh, these gold salt phospholipid containing ones, um, will kill the cells a bit. And even at two gray, we see this, you know, reduction of, um, you know, the sensitization to radiation. Um, and even just at four gray, um, and especially six, so, th you know, there's no cells that really survive. Um, and this is, you know, a plot of the logged uh, surviving fraction against radiation dose. Um, and we do see um, a sensitization effect. Um, and interestingly, um, you know, so we see GPX4 go down as expected. Um, and the expression of P21 will, uh, it localizes to DNA damage sites uh, follow, following ionizing radiation. And we, we see an increase in P21, which would suggest that there is more DNA damage. Um, so here I did this with 10 nanomolar and CWR1 cells. Um, I tried it again with a lower dose doing uh, 5 nanomolar. This time it really looks like P21 goes up a lot. Um, you know, even though it was a little bit less of a radio sensitization effect. Um, moving forward, um, I also did it in 22 RB1 cells, which were a lot more sensitive. So, you know, while 5 nanomolar had not as much of an effect, um, you know, here, it, you know, there's not even uh, really much of a uh, synergy effect that you can see because the cells are pretty much completely dead at 5 nanomolar. Uh, and again, we see P21 go up, um, a decrease in GPX4. That ends a bit off here. Um, but I still think that, you know, GPX4 goes down and that 
P21 is, is increased. Um, next, I'll show these are ranafin uh, containing ones where ranafin, this gold salt compound, is embedded into the phospholipid bilayer. Um, and these kill the cells even more. There's, you know, 22 every one cells are completely dead even without radiation. Um, and here we see, you know, uh, in the 22 RB1 cells that, you know, again, they kill the cells pretty good. P21 is way up in, you know, both cell lines, I would say, um, you know, suggesting more DNA damage. Um, and then last, I'll, I'll show these are, are aranafin organic core ones where the aranafin is loaded on the inside. Um, what I will say is that these nanoparticles have less aranafin. Um, so these have about three aranafin per nanoparticle, while these have about 15. So it, you know, it does make sense that having, uh, you know, more aranafin, this gold salt compound that will, you know, enhance the physical uh, radiation dose will kill the cells more than these. Um, and additionally, GPX4 doesn't really go down with these. So it really is correlated, um, you know, the GPX4 expression with, um, you know, how much the, the cells die. Um, and just, you know, to say, you know, next steps, um, I'm working on, you know, characterizing, you know, the highest efficacy HDL nanoparticle radiosensitizer. Um, and I, I want to, you know, confirm this enhancement of DNA damage uh, with ionizing radiation. You know, uh, gamma H2AX foci formation is a marker of uh, DNA double strand break. So, you know, this is what the staining would look like. Um, starting to work on this. Another one um, to look at DNA damage is comet assay, where, uh, you know, the more DNA damage there is, the more it will look like a comet. Um, and, you know, once we have this nailed down, you know, we're uh, looking to move forward with uh, mouse xenograft studies with the Van der Gren lab at UIC. Um, they actually have a, a focal radio sensitizer, so it's, it's a radiation beam, so you can avoid uh, irradiating the whole mouse. You can just uh, shoot the beam at the tumor, um, and we'll see what happens. Uh, and what we also want to do is we want to do some RNA-seq to look at gene expression changes and cell redox balance and DNA damage response. Um, we have some, you know, thoughts as to why GPX4 uh, is downregulated by our nanoparticles, um, but, you know, it would be good to understand that better um, and also understand uh, how, you know, the crosstalk with uh, cell death from the HDL nanoparticles, how it synergizes with ionizing radiation. Um, and lastly, we, we have, we've already sent off some samples to the Spitz lab at the University of Iowa. Um, and they have these uh, targeted enzyme activity assays that will let us know, um, you know, if we are in fact targeting thioreductin reductase with aranafin um, and GPX4 function. Um, so yeah, just, you know, acknowledgements. Thank you to the Thaxon lab, uh, my committee and, you know, the training program and yeah. Does anyone have any questions? All right. Thank you, Sophia. Any questions, anyone? Oh, I may. Yeah, um, go ahead. Were you conceiving this talk at, or conceiving this treatment for the initial, like the primary cancer or the recurrence or both? Both. It's definitely something we thought about. Um, you know, like what, what would the best application be to use it at? Um, you know, another thought is uh, how well it would work systemically. So, I mean, I think our first experiments would, to, would be in mice to do like an intratumoral injection to show first that it works. Um, and then, you know, if we could administer it systemically, you know, that would, um, you know, mimic, uh, you know, how it would be treated for metastases, so more advanced prostate cancer. Um, so yeah, definitely think about both. In, in your data then, um, is one of the cell lines you looked at a primary cell line and the other one a recurrent cell line? They're, or... they're, bo they're both recurrent, but one of the, the one okay. where it worked uh, worse than the other, um, when, you know, like the, where it didn't, the cells is definitely a more aggressive uh, cell line. 
So, it, you know, it really did, uh, you know, it, it doesn't work as well in the aggressive cancer cell line as much. Um, but, you know, we do have plans to look at other ones as well. Thank you. Um, and I see that there's a, a question. Are, are the doses you're testing currently comparable to the radiation fractions administered in the clinical setting? Um, well, when we do our, our mouse studies, we want to look at, um, you know, there's, you could do like stereotactic radiation where it's like higher doses, but fewer. Um, and then there's hypofractionation, which is, uh, or yeah, the conventional fractionation is uh, two gray doses. So what we were planning to do um, initially was to look at, um, you know, if we were to do two bigger doses of 12 gray in mice or to do uh, like five days of two gray, um, which two gray is used in the, the conventional, um, you know, men will, will go in for, you know, a, a couple months of two gray every day, um, which is one thing we would like to test. Um, and then again, we're also not 100% sure how, um, you know, it'll translate over into mice. Um, that's another thought, you know, will we need to go higher? Will the, or, you know, then with the in vitro studies, um, yeah. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, anyone else? There's no other questions. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah, we'll head over to Lucas. It's been our final talk. Right on time. We're doing great. <laughs> uh, okay. So one second. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Lucas. I'm a third year graduate student in the Bachman Lab, um, as well as a trainee with the Physical Genomics uh, Center. And I'm going to share some research updates from my last year of work on, tra on transcription and chromatin organization. So a bit of background on chromatin organization. Um, if you look really closely using electron, uh, chromatin electron microscopy, uh, we can make out these uh, fine scale features of chromatin. And you can see that uh, at nucleosomal length scales, chromatin forms these uh, beat, beat on a string structures that are composed of these clutches of nucleosomes and linker regions. And if we zoom out a bit to the meso, the meso supranucleosomal level, um, you'll see that chromatin occupies a lot of space in the nucleus and forms these larger heterogeneous domain-like structures. So these chromatin domains have fractal behavior and they follow a polymer scaling law where the physical space that they occupy um, in the nucleus scales with their fractal dimension, D. And uh, high D domains um, are more space filling while low D domains uh, tend to be less space filling. So going into this project, our lab made a few observations on transcription and chromatin organization. Um, we did some, uh, some early storm imaging and found that pole two is overwhelmingly located on the periphery of packing domains. And then in a publication from a collaborator's lab that was published a while ago, they uh, found that inhibiting transcription with a number of drugs um, causes chromatin to compact. And beyond that, there's also, uh, also many other imaging and omics papers that have been published um, in recent years that make similar observations about this relationship between transcription and organization. So these observations raise an interesting question. Um, are chromatin domains at the mesoscale scale level formed and maintained by transcription, formed or maintained by transcription? So when I started this project, the first thing I did was test several of the aforementioned transcriptional inhibitors um, using a flow adapted version of an RNA clicket assay to confirm when RNA transcription is inhibited. And I found that um, inhibiting with actinomycin D uh, leads to full inhibition almost immediately. And this makes sense, ACT-D inhibits all three polymerases, um, along with a few other targets. And you can see that in the ACT-D uh, histogram, most of the remaining RNA signal is depleted. Um, most of the other drugs target POL2 or, or one other polymerase plus POL2, and they always have a little bit of residual um, uh, signal, signal compared to ACT-D. And with all these drugs, with the exception of triptolite, all the drugs I tried inhibited trans transcription under three hours. Um, just quickly before moving on, I want to quickly ex explain this live cell imaging technique that I've relied on really heavily for some of my early experimental results. So uh, if we want to assess chromatin confirmation changes after transcriptional inhibition, um, we have this in-house tool that was developed 
called partial wave spectroscopy. And what PWS does is it measures variations in spectral light interference um, resulting from light scattering due to heterogeneities in chromatin structure. And what this does is allow us to, to detect changes in chromatin conformation below the resolution limit of light. Um, and from that, what we can get is a, a map of chromatin packing scaling, uh, the diffusion or speed of chromatin domains that are moving in the nucleus, and the size or magnitude of chromatin domains moving around the nucleus um, as an average over the entire nucleus. So initially, we did a one-hour partial wave imaging experiment with all of the aforementioned drugs um, following inhibition for one hour. And we saw that there was no change in packing scaling for most of these drugs at that time point. Um, but actinomycin D very, uh, had a very strong phenotype right off the bat and Im immediately lowered packing scaling from 2.5 to nearly 2. Uh, seeing that ACT-D is a really effective transcriptional inhibitor, uh, we tried it on several more lines to see if the effect could be replicated across more than one cellular context. And it did, it was very consistent uh, in lowering D across multiple cellular contexts. And then more recently, two mem members of our lab generated um, uh, chrome stem data for ACT-D treated cells. Uh, chrome stem is electron microscopy uh, applied to, to chromatin structure. So PWS, like I mentioned before, gives us an average over the entire nucleus, but chromatin electron microscopy can uh, allow us to gather information on individual domains in the nucleus. So what I'm showing here is some of the results from their analysis. On the left, you can see that um, ACT-D treated cells had uh, overall had larger domains. And in the middle, um, ACT-D treated cells had a higher D as well. And then finally on the right, the average uh, chromatin volume concentration increased for ACT-D -ACT treated cells. So from these results, uh, we can see that inhibition of transcription increases domain size and packing scaling. So We've so far mostly done imaging experiments, and I, want, I wanted to reanalyze some publicly, high, uh, publicly available high C data um, that use actinomycin D as a perturbation so that we could compare omics genome connectivity to our imaging data. And in my reanalysis, I found that the probability of being in contact for two loci um, decreased at these shorter, shorter length scales. Those shorter length scales are where you see domains, uh, loops, uh, those kinds of features in the, in the nucleus, and it increased at long length scales. So beyond the size of domains, compartments, and beyond that. And then consistent with the electron microscopy results, I observed that ACT also decreased the number of smaller aggregates or domains and increased uh, somewhat larger aggregates, both in size, but uh, a little bit in number. Next, I uh, took the log ratio of the distal and local contacts uh, using a moving window average. So this uh, distal to local ratio measures the change of long-range long, long range interactions, in this case, 1 million base pairs above and below. And this analysis again confirmed what we saw in our imaging data, that um, long-range long interactions are favored over short-range interactions with actinomyas and D-treated cells. And for single chromosomes, you can see that as you move along the length of the chromosome from short length scales to longer length scales, there's a divergence between uh, actinomyas and D-treated cells and uh, non-treated cells. And finally, I applied the same analysis to length scales within the size range of packing domains um, to get an idea of whether or not uh, contacts change within the size of packing domains. And we got a pretty similar pattern where local contacts are shed in favor of more distant contacts. So overall from this PWS data, the chrome stem data and the high C analysis, uh, we, I think we can see that what we end up with is a reduction in the total number of domains. We get smaller domains aggregating into larger domains and then chromatin volume concentration across the nucleus decreases. Um, but overall, there's a, a also a decrease in nuclear fractal dimension since everything is aggregating. So as most of you are probably familiar, uh, one of the challenges of using transcriptional inhibitors and drugs in general is that they have a complicated mechanism of action. Oftentimes, their mechanism of action targets more than one protein. Um, actinomycin D is no exception since it targets all three polymerate, uh, polymerases and also uh, topoisomerases. Um, so we wanted to try to use something that was a little bit more targeted to see uh, what the phenotype was. So not long ago, we got our hands on a pol 2 degrad line, where pol 2 is degraded after the addition of auxin. Um, the first thing I did with this line was uh, just check to see if uh, transcription was inhibited. 
and if the pole two was actually degraded. What I found was that after six hours, uh, pole two was both degraded and transcription inhibited. And then after that, we uh, generated and analyzed a large data set of poll du P2S data. And we found that D was basically unchanged, or packing scaling was basically unchanged after six hours of poll 2 removal. <clears throat> However, the diffusion of fractional moving mass results uh, gave us a much more definitive phenotype for this. So diffusion is the rate, uh, rate that chromatin aggregates over, over moving within the nucleus. And then fractional moving mass uh, on the left, um, it tells us how, how the magnitude of the aggregates of chromatin that are moving around, um, around and diffusing through the nucleus. And so we observed after pole 2 degradation, um, the size of chromatin aggregates increases, and then chromatin diffuses more slowly across the nucleus at both time points. <clears throat> so seeing that the ACT treatment and the pole 2 degron had very different uh, contrasting phenotypes, I wanted to get my hands on a high C data set that used uh, a Dagon system to target polymerases so that we could look at uh, chromatin contacts with just removing the polymerases by themselves without the uh, uh, diverse, diverse uh, mechanism of action. So I reanalyzed this uh, publicly available data set for all three polymerases and mouse ESC lines. Um, I found that pole one and pole two had the strongest phenotypes, and pole three basically had uh, a nil phenotype. So I focused on pole one and pole two for the rest of the analysis. Um, from these contact probability plots, you can see that the phenotype is not as extreme as it is with, uh, with actinomyosin D, but there is some, some changes. Pole one gains long distance contacts, pole two sheds some uh, short distance contacts or local contacts, and gains a few long distance contacts. So to compare between the, the pole dagrons and the actinomyosin D, I applied the same distal local analysis I previously used um, for long length scales above 1 million base pairs and below 1 million base pairs. And interestingly, I found that pole one degradation led to um, an increase in long distance contacts and a more pronounced phenotype. <clears throat> the movie we saw before, not as pronounced as ACT-D, obviously, but uh, in the context of, of this analysis, I think it's pretty interesting. Um, and then I applied the same uh, distal local analysis that I previously used with ACT-D for shorter length scales inside the, the size range of chromatin domains and found similarly that pole 2 degradation leads to an increase in short range contacts. Um, the last thing I did for this, for this data set is I calculated the contact scaling for contact probability for each conditioning condition as like a moving window average. Um, within the size range of chromatin domains, as we have we measured them in imaging experiments. So contact scaling is the rate um, that contacts are made or lost. And um, we've experimentally confirmed in our lab that it's inversely proportional to D. So since we can relate S to D, it's a pretty useful metric that we can use to compare imaging data and see how chromatin contacts change. And what you can see here is that it kind of confirms what we saw with the contact probability plot that um, pole one gains contacts in the size range of domains, while pole two contact scaling in general decreases slightly. Both phenotypes are, are relatively modest, but there is a phenotype. So based on our reanalysis of the high C data, we wanted to see if pole one and pole two acted together on chromatin. Um, there was this publication that came out recently that found that when you remove pole one uh, with a pole one dagron, pole two was differentially downregulated at a number of sites. Um, we suspected that pole one and pole two may be acting together to organize chromatin. So I pulled some publicly available chip seek data in the same cell type and um, reanalyzed it and found that pole one sites and pole two sites do overlap marginally. And following up on that, um, I wanted to look a little bit more at where pole one is bound in the genome. So we found that pole one chip peaks were enriched at the at centromeric regions and at heterochromatic regions where expression should be repressed. And then pole one was also enriched uh, around pole two transcriptional machine and ribosomal genes. Ribosomal genes were more of a sanity check. Um, the takeaway here is that in addition to ribosomal genes, pole one's enriched in these inactive structural regions and, and also in places that are, are suppressed like developmental genes. 
um, where pole two is enriched in euchromatic transcript uh, trans transcript regions, and this could be potentially suggest that they act together to organize euchromatin and heterochromatin, respectively. So between the pole IC data and the chip seq analysis, um, we started thinking that pole one may have a role in organizing chromatin and heterochromatic regions, and that pole one and pole two may be acting together to organize mesoscale chromatin. Um, to investigate this further, uh, I got a hold of a pole one Dagron line uh, very recently, and the same cell type as our pole two line. And the first thing I did was just test it for inhibition of pole one transcription following degradation. And you can see that uh, by four hours, uh, pole one transcription of our DNA is almost completely reduced. But by after three hours, there's almost no pole one. So using those time points, I generated a pole, pole one PWS data set um, at three hours. And alongside that, I also treated uh, some myoblast cells that were given to me with uh, pole, two pole one specific inhibiting treatments. This more recent uh, cancer drug, CX5461, and a low concentration of ACT that only targets pole one. So in both drug treatments and the pole one line, uh, chromatin packing scaling decreased very modestly. Not a very strong phenotype. But like the pole two degradation experiment, the diffusion and fractional moving mass phenotype were more pronounced. Um, like pole two, diffusion of chromatin decreases in the pole one degradation line, but the drug treatments have actually the opposite phenotype where chromatin actually appears to become more mobile after pole one is inhibited. <clears throat> so we see a similar pattern with the magnitude of chromatin domains that are moving around um, where they're smaller in both drug treatments but pole one has larger aggregates of chromatin moving around in the nucleus. And just to summarize some of this experimental data, um, what we can see so far is that knocking out both polymerases individually using dagrons uh, leads to a decrease in chromatin mobility and an increase in the size of chromatin aggregates that are moving around or the magnitude of chromatin aggregates. Um, the drugs have had an opposing phenotype. <clears throat> But our, act, our actinomycin D chromatin electron microscopy results are more consistent with the pole one Dagron PWS results, um, where we can see that smaller domains aggregating with larger domains and then reducing the, the total chromatin volume concentration. Uh, one potential model that fits some of this experimental data was recently proposed by some collaborators of ours, where uh, polymerase actively modulates loop extrusion um, through a negative supercoiling mechanism on the surface of chromatin packing domains. And these packing domains are com uh, comprised of heterochromatin, and in their model, uh, actively transcribing polymerase uh, exchanges heterochromatin uh, in the domain for euchromatin on the surface of the domain to loop extrusion. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, that's all I have. I'm happy to take some questions. Fantastic. Thanks, Lucas. Uh, questions? From anybody. It was, it was too good. It was just too good. Lucas and people are probably. Oh, Thomas, please. Sure. Um, <laughs> I know I'm monopolizing the question and answer. Oh, it's um, fabulous. Thank you so much. <clears throat> what, what, um, are there specific biophysical, like single molecule experiments you could do to um, confirm or some or distinguish between different models of what could be going on with the transcription here? Could you now that you found this association? In what sense? In what sense, like a single molecule experiment? Well, you're you're proposing yeah. that there's something with these loops, right? Um, is it are are there ways to have like a, oh, to construct, say, uh, do you need, to, do you require the cell or can you, I guess my question is, do you require all of the cells machinery or can you just put say DNA and the required proteins in a solution somehow and do some experiments to, uh, that would oh, help yeah. you distinguish between what's going on here? I think so. Yeah, I haven't really considered doing a, an in vitro biochemical assay like that. Um, I'm sure they exist. There's a few other experiments that are, feel a little bit more pressing that will give us more information. Um, in particular, we're waiting on, on some storm analysis of these that will tell us 
where where the different polymerases are located in each perturbation and also how chromatin changes. It'll give us more information on the PWS, which is more of an exploratory mechanism or method. But certainly, yeah, we could look into that. You, you need the cell. Okay, cool. Uh, Thanks. To, to bluntly answer, I mean, just the size of the structures that we're talking about moving around, um, they're like 50 to 100 nanometers in size. Um, so they're not like easy to synthesize ex vivo. Um, and it seems like this is, I mean, big picture chromatin seems to be like a stochastically evolving self-organized system. Mm -hmm. So the perturbations that we do are in the context of like what the system is doing overall. Um, and what I mean by that is like the presence of, you know, the heterochromatin enzymes is going to couple with the polymerases or the loop extrusion molecules, where if you took them out um, and you said, okay, if I look at the polymerase and you can measure the amount of force that's generated, say, on the supercoiling from Paul 1, that doesn't necessarily translate into what would happen to the 3D geometry that forms. Cool. Thank you.